Hello all, welcome back to Climate Dynamics. Today in Lecture 5, we're going to try to bring together a lot of the concepts that we've been talking to to date and talk about the general circulation of the Earth's atmosphere. The corresponding reading for this is Marshall and Plum Chapter 5, which discusses the marional structure of the atmosphere, and Chapter 8, which discusses the general circulation. The definitions we'll learn in this section include geostrophic wind, polar cell, feral cell, Hadley cell, intertropical convergence zone, jet streams, atmospheric rivers, thermal wind, veering winds, and backing winds. The key questions that we're going to answer are, what are the dominant forms of balance in the atmosphere? What are the primary drivers for meridional structure of the atmosphere? What are the four mechanisms for meridional heat transport? What are, where are these mechanisms dominant? What are the key features of the Hadley cell and the Farrell cell? And how are meridional temperatures and zonal wind speeds connected with one another? All right, before we proceed on to the general circulation, we're going to review balanced flow. The atmosphere to a large degree is in a state of equilibriated balance. There are two standard dominant balances that exist within the atmosphere, one in the horizontal direction, known as geostrophic balance, and one in the vertical direction, known as hydrostatic balance. We've already reviewed concepts related to hydrostatic balance. Remember, in hydrostatic balance, fluid parcels experience zero net force in the vertical because of a balance between vertical pressure gradient forces and gravity. With geostrophic balance, we are not dealing with gravity since that only works in the vertical direction. But the atmosphere nonetheless assembles itself in a state of balance by balancing horizontal pressure gradient force with Coriolis force. In general, this form of balance holds in the mid-latitudes away from the equator, where Coriolis force is sufficiently large. It also holds far enough away from the surface where friction is negligible. In the next lecture, we'll discuss the case where friction is not negligible. All right. So generally in the atmosphere, whenever you have a perturbation from geostrophic balance, the atmosphere will act to smooth out those perturbations through a process known as ge geostrophic adjustment. Geostrophic adjustment simply refers to an adjustment of the atmosphere, that is the production of gravity waves and other forms of waves, that are designed to adjust the system back towards geostrophic balance. Processes that, inter it, that introduce these perturbations include things like localized warming or topographic influences that can perturb the lower level geopotential structure. So the dominant drivers of horizontal motion on large scales, if you recall back to introduction to atmospheric dynamics where we derived equations governing fluid motion, specifically the dynamics of that fluid motion, you'll recall that for horizontal motion, the primary forces are pressure gradient and Coriolis force. The time rate of change of the velocity of a fluid parcel on constant pressure surfaces is given by the gradient of the geopotential field on that pressure surface, Recall that is simply the height of that pressure surface multiplied by the gravitational acceleration and the Coriolis force. When pressure gradient force and Coriolis force simultaneously act on the fluid parcel, we find that the fluid parcels tend to move along lines of constant pressure. Consider this depiction. We have a fluid parcel at its initial location at the bottom of this diagram. We have a pressure gradient that exists between high pressure at the bottom of the diagram and low pressure at the top. Because of the presence of this constant pressure gradient, the fluid parcel will experience an acceleration towards the top of the diagram. In this particular scenario, again, we're assuming a constant pressure gradient. However, as the fluid parcel begins to accelerate, that is, as its velocity increases, it will begin to experience a Coriolis force. Recall the Coriolis force is proportional to the magnitude of the velocity of the fluid parcel, so the faster it's moving, the stronger the Coriolis force that acts on it. The Coriolis force in the northern hemisphere works to the right of the direction of motion of the fluid parcel, so in this case that force will be acting to turn the fluid parcel to the right. As it turns more and more to the right, we find that this Coriolis force ends up perfectly balancing the pressure gradient force that acts towards the top of the diagram. So, for instance, in this case, if the top of the diagram represented north and the bottom south, we would find that the pressure gradient force acted northward, the Coriolis force acts southward, and the fluid parcel tends to propagate to the east. Again, the velocity of the fluid parcel to the east is in, it indicates that the Coriolis force is acting to the right of the fluid parcel motion, thus is acting to the south. This 
scenario cannot be repeated if the fluid parcel is moving in the opposite direction. That is, if it's moving to the west, the Coriolis force and the pressure gradient force would be aligned with one another, and the system would not be in balance. The tendency for fluid parcels in order to follow along these lines of constant pressure is known as geostrophic balance. Here at 300 millibars, which is fairly high in the atmosphere, we can see a depiction of geostrophic winds, which are calculated from this balance of pressure gradient force and Coriolis force shown with the blue wind barbs, and the observed wind shown with the red wind barbs. First of all, you'll notice that there is pretty strong agreement between the observed wind field and the geostrophically balanced wind field. Further, you'll notice that the geostrophic winds tend to follow along these lines of constant geopotential, which are indicated with the black curves in this diagram. Thus, we can conclude that the atmosphere, particularly this high up, tends to satisfy geostrophic balance. It tends to follow along lines of constant geopotential. So the three key observations that we have from this figure, at upper levels, the observed wind is parallel to geopotential height contours. In general, wind is faster when height contours are closer together, and wind is slower when height contours are farther apart. In this case, the stronger pressure gradient force that is present when height contours are closer together indicates that the wind will be blowing faster. That is, you need to have a stronger Coriolis force that balances that stronger pressure gradient force in order for the fluid parcel to be moving along a line of constant geopotential. However, in order for that to occur, we must have the fluid parcel is propagating with a large velocity itself. So contours that are closer together produce faster winds. Contours that are farther apart are indicative of weak, temp or weak pressure gradients and hence are indicative of weaker wind speeds. All right, let's solve for this quantitatively. If we assume that acceleration is small and, assume, and solve for the basic state of geostrophic balance, we will observe that you can extract the wind speeds from the Coriolis term, which is the second term on the right-hand side of the equal sign, and solve for that corresponding component of the velocity field. In terms of the pressure gradient term, which is shown as a gradient of the geopotential, and the Coriolis parameter f. Thus, we have the formal definition for the geostrophic wind as the theoretical wind that results from this exact balance of pressure gradient and Coriolis force. Note that the Coriolis parameter f is proportional to the sine of the latitude. Thus, at the equator where the latitude is equal to zero, we have that the Coriolis parameter is also equal to zero. At this point, the equations above cannot be solved for a geostrophic wind. Thus, the geostrophic wind cannot be employed in the vicinity of the equator. Note that outside of the equator, though, the geostrophic wind explains approximately 90% of the total wind speed away from the surface, where friction is negligible. So, in the free atmosphere, it is a very good approximation to the actual observed wind speeds. These are the formulas for geostrophic wind that I encourage you to memorize. Note that the geostrophic wind is perpendicular to geopotential gradients. That is, it is always moving along lines of constant geopotential. Recall that the geopotential gradients are going to be perpendicular to those lines of constant geopotential. All right, so we can estimate the actual velocity of the fluid parcel by looking at the distance between geopotential contours. On this diagram, in gray, we show four potential geopotential contours going from the lowest value of geopotential in the north to the highest value on the bottom. So in this case, the gradient of the geopotential is actually pointing to the south, from smaller values to larger values. In order to estimate the geostrophic wind experienced by the fluid parcel, we can use a finite difference approximation to the derivative. That is, we're going to approximate di phi di y via a difference of phi over the distance delta y. Observe here that over the distance delta y, we have that phi decreases by 2 delta phi. So, this approximation delta di phi di y is given by negative 2 delta phi divided by delta y. So, the geostrophic wind can then be obtained by solving this equation for ug. Note that to the left, where we have geopotential contours that are closer together in space, we will have a larger velocity because you'll have a greater change in phi over a shorter distance. To the right of the diagram, where the geopotential contours spread out, we'll have a slower velocity associated with the wind, because here the change in geopotential over the distance delta y is smaller.
Geostrophic flow implies certain flow directions about local high and low pressure centers. On the left hand side here we have a typical flow diagram around a high pressure center. Specifically the pressure gradient force works to push the fluid parcel away from the high. That is, the tendency for pressure gradient force is to push fluid parcels from high pressure to low pressure. The Coriolis force must act to balance the pressure gradient force for the flow to be in geostrophic balance. Consequently, the flow direction must be to the southwest and the Coriolis force then points to the northwest. On the right hand diagram we have a typical flow around a low pressure center. In this case, the pressure gradient force acts to push the fluid parcel towards the low and the Coriolis force must again balance that by pushing to the southeast. Thus, the flow direction must be to the northeast to be at a 90 degree angle to the Coriolis force. Both of these flow directions work in the northern hemisphere. In the southern hemisphere, the same force vectors are maintained, but the flow direction is flipped because the Coriolis parameter is negative in the southern hemisphere. This discussion of geostrophic balance will be relevant when we assess the connection between zonal wind speeds and the pressures of the atmosphere. All right, let's turn our attention to the drivers of meridional structure of the Earth's atmosphere. Okay, let's go back very early in the class to our second lecture where we discussed energy in the system. Recall our definition of insulation, a measure of solar radiation received on a given surface area and recorded during a given time. Because of the curvature of the Earth's surface, the total amount of energy received per unit area varies latitudinally. That is, where sun where the sun is directly overhead or where its rays hit approximately perpendicular to the Earth's surface, we have the highest concentration of solar energy per unit area. At higher latitudes, where the rays are oblique relative to the surface, we have the same amount of energy covering a larger surface area, and consequently we have less energy per unit area. This then implies that we're going to have more warming, more radiative warming, occurring in the equatorial regions and less in the polar regions. Seasonal variations in insulation are very important for driving seasonal changes in the meridional structure of the atmosphere. From an annual average perspective, we have that energy tends to be maximized around the equator with a drop-off in insulation to about 180 watts per meter squared in the polar regions. However, on a seasonal basis, we have very different profiles, for instance, on June 21st on the Northern Hemisphere summer solstice and on December 21st, the Northern Hemisphere winter solstice. At these points, the insulation is actually maximal at the two polar locations, on June 21st at the North Pole and on December 21st on, at the South Pole. Consequently, we expect there to be significant shifts in these overall meridional profiles as a function of the time of year. Nonetheless, on an annual average, global average scale, we see a very familiar trend. Specifically, we see warmer temperatures in the equatorial regions and cooler temperatures at the poles. The zonal heterogeneity that we see is primarily due to variations in the land surface. That is, differences in topographic height drive different temperatures over land, as well as warmer temperatures associated with the lower heat capacity of land. Here is a latitude pressure cross-section of the atmosphere, on the top right showing the annual climatology. Here we see our familiar warmer temperatures at the surface equator and cooler temperatures as we move towards the poles. We also see our linear lapse rate associated with the troposphere, where rising fluid parcels cool and expand as they go to lower pressures, as well as warming temperatures throughout the stratosphere, above approximately the 100 hectopascal pressure level. There are some other features here, though, that are particularly interesting. Notice that the tropical uh, stratosphere or tropical tropopause region ex exhibits some of the coolest temperatures across the Earth. This is because of the much higher tropopause in the tropical regions, because of uplift driven by convection in this region. That is, because the troposphere's lapse rate persists over a larger vertical extent, we see it reaching cooler temperatures overall. Besides this, though, the two hemispheres are roughly symmetric with one another. 
with slightly cooler average temperatures seen in Antarctica. And that's associated with isolation of Antarctica because of circulations that occur around the Antarctic continent. In the northern hemisphere, that isolation tends not to occur because of heterogeneity of the land surface, prevent, preventing the occurrence of a circumpolar jet. If we look at the different seasons, what we see is that the surface profile showing highest temperatures occurring at the equatorial surface generally holds with a slight shift towards the summer hemisphere. That is, in December to February, we see slightly warmer temperatures occurring in the southern hemisphere, and in June to August, we see slightly warmer temperatures occurring in the northern hemisphere. The tropical troposphere still exhibits fairly cool temperatures, but the coldest temperatures now are being exhibited in the northern hemisphere summertime uh, period over the South Pole. That is because of strong isolation of this particular region at the tropopause level and through the stratosphere. Consequently, it's not experiencing any incoming radiation, and so it cools over the winter season in the southern hemisphere. Notably, in the stratosphere, we also see a fairly consistent temperature profile that is more consistent with the insulation distribution that we saw earlier. Namely, we see temperatures increase effectively from South Pole to North Pole in the Northern Hemisphere summer, and from North Pole to South Pole in the Southern Hemisphere summer. The dotted lines here show the approximate location of the tropopause. Note that the tropopause tends to be higher in the equatorial regions and lower in the polar regions. Note that this primarily occurs because of deep convection in the tropical regions pushing up the tropopause. This is also a mechanism by which tropospheric air is actually able to escape into the stratosphere. Namely, in the tropics, air that rises up to the troposphere can expand laterally. Because the tropopause decays in altitude as you go towards the poles, lateral movement from the tropics can inject air into the stratosphere. This is also one of the reasons why chlorofluorocarbons, which are responsible for ozone destruction, are able to escape into the stratosphere primarily through this tropical conduit. That is, the chlorofluorocarbons that are in the tropical atmosphere rise up, hit the tropopause, and are able to move laterally into the stratosphere where they can cause problems for ozone destruction. All right, the key things to take home from these temperature diagrams is that in the stratosphere, temperature gradients tend to agree with the latitudinal structure of incoming solar radiation, whereas in the troposphere, the maximal temperatures tend to occur near the equator, particularly in the summer hemisphere. The temperature profiles that we saw also determine the meridional specific humidity profiles. That is, they determine where moisture is located in the atmosphere. Recall we discussed previously that specific humidity tends to decrease as one goes towards cooler temperatures. Thus, on average, specific humidity is largest near the equatorial surface with values of about 17 grams per kilogram. As one goes towards higher latitudes or higher altitudes, specific humidity drops off rapidly. The overall specific humidity profile is fairly consistent with the temperature profile. That is, the annual mean is largest at about the equator, but in the northern hemisphere summer, one sees higher values of specific humidity in the northern hemisphere, and in the southern hemisphere summer, we see higher values of specific humidity to the south. Relative humidity, on the other hand, is a different beast. Recall relative humidity is equal to specific humidity divided by saturation specific humidity. Since saturation specific humidity has strong temperature dependence, Specifically, at low temperatures, saturation-specific humidity is also small. We instead see three peaks of the relative humidity along these latitudes. Specifically, we see a peak in the South Pole, at the equator, and at the North Pole. In the, the polar regions, the saturation-specific humidity is small, and so the ratio of specific humidity to saturation-specific humidity remains near 100%. At the equator, the specific humidity and the saturation-specific humidity are both relatively large. Relative humidity hits its minimum at about 30 degrees north and 30 degrees south in the mid-troposphere. Air has risen over the equatorial band and is subsiding now at 30 degrees north and 30 degrees south. 
Much of this air has very little moisture associated with it because that moisture has been condensed out when it rose initially through the equatorial atmosphere. All right, so let's go back to discussing the temperature gradients and the latitudinal dependence of those temperature gradients. We already know that much of the heating occurs in the equatorial regions with significantly less radiation incident on the surface in the polar regions. However, the outgoing radiation does not match this profile exactly. Instead, what we tend to see is a surplus of energy in the equatorial regions and a deficit in the polar regions. That is, in the equatorial regions we have more incoming energy than outgoing energy, and in the polar regions we have more outgoing energy than incoming energy. The point at which these two lines cross each other is around 35 to 40 degrees in either hemisphere. In order to compensate for this difference in the energy budget, we must have heat transport that occurs from the equatorial regions to the polar regions in order to maintain an energy balance. That is, the surplus of energy that is incurred at the equatorial regions gets transported to the polar regions where it is then emitted. This maintains warmer temperatures through the polar regions that are significantly warmer than if a pure local energy balance was to hold. The meridional heat transport that is responsible for the redistribution of energy in this sense is also responsible for large-scale circulation patterns and other regional weather features. Specifically, the heat transport is effectively what we experience as weather, and it is the attempt of the Earth in order to redistribute this energy surplus towards the poles. Here's a plot showing the approximate northward energy transport occurring as a result of the energy imbalance. Specifically, we see that this energy transport is maximized again between about 30 degrees and 40 degrees in either hemisphere. These values are of course quite large, approaching 6 petawatts at the point of maximum heat transport. But compare this, for instance, to the total amount of energy incident on the Earth's surface from the Sun, which if you recall from Lecture 2, is about 174 petawatts. So the amount of energy transferred is only a fraction of the total amount of energy received. With that said, this global heat transport is nonetheless the way in which we experience the underlying climate system. Okay, so how is the heat actually transported? There are four primary mechanisms by which the heat is transported. The first is the large-scale circulation, which is bulk transport via the Hadley circulation. And we'll go into some details momentarily on what exactly that is. This is the primary mechanism for atmospheric heat transport near the equator. Once we get to the mid-latitudes, however, heat is typically transported via eddy flux of temperature. This occurs via turbulent eddies, such as extratropical cyclones, and this mechanism arises naturally due to the rotation of the Earth. The third mechanism is via meridional latent heat transport. Recall latent heat is basically energy that is stored within heated moisture. Moisture which then condenses when it reaches northern latitudes, releases that energy. The transport of this moisture from the subtropics to the mid-latitudes is then another major mechanism that enables this global heat transport. Finally, our fourth mechanism is via ocean currents. That is, the ocean itself carries heat with it as it circulates through the system. All right, let's look at the meridional circulation in order to better understand how this heat transport is manifesting in reality. There are three primary cells that emerge through the Earth's system. These cells are regions where the Earth recirculates air. In the Hadley cell, which is located closest to the equator, we have rising motion at the equator that then circulates north and south. It then subsides near about 30 degrees north and south in the subtropics. The returning branch of the Hadley circulation then moves across the surface, providing air to the surface of the equator. The feral cell is the second cell in this model. It occurs primarily in the mid-latitudes as a second circu secondary circulation feature with variable airflow and temperature. The air within this region is heavily mixed by large-scale eddies. Nonetheless, we have sinking motion that approximately occurs in the subtropics associated with the sinking branch of the Hadley circulation. We also have a rising branch in the polar latitudes close to about 60 degrees north and south. This is associated with air that rises along the polar front. Finally, the polar cell, located in the northernmost latitudes between 60 degrees and the pole, um, is associated with rising motion at the polar front and subsidence occurring at the poles. This three-cell model naturally emerges in the Earth system because the rotation of the planet prevents a, a single cell 
from circulating from equator to pole. The meridional circulation can perhaps be best visualized using the Eulerian zonal mean mass stream function. This function is preserved following fluid parcels, so fluid parcels tend to move along lines of constant stream function. The blue regions corresponding to negative values of the stream function are associated with counterclockwise motion, whereas the lighter colored regions, the warmer regions, are associated with clockwise rotation. What you see is rising motion near the equator and subsidence or sinking motion occurring in the subtropics at 30 degrees north and south. This is the primary circulation cell shown in the middle of each diagram, which is the Hadley cell. Although on average the rising branch of the Hadley cell is located near the equator, it does have a strong seasonality associated with it. Namely, during the southern hemisphere summer, the Hadley circulation shifts into the southern hemisphere, and the rising branch of the circulation is at about 15 degrees south. In the northern hemisphere summer, the Hadley cell shifts into the northern hemisphere, and the rising branch of the circulation is about at 15 degrees north. The other cells also appear in this diagram, but note that they do not tend to extend as high, nor are they as intense as this central circulation. Let's examine the Hadley circulation in more detail now. All right, here's our depiction of the general circulation of the Earth's atmosphere. The Hadley cell appears as the strong circulation closest to the equator. It's associated with near surface low pressure at the equator, near surface high pressure in the subtropics. It's associated with rising motion at the equator and subsidence in the subtropics. Further, it's associated with trade winds that extend through the extent of the Hadley circulation. These are winds that blow steadily from the northeast in the northern hemisphere and from the southeast in the southern hemisphere. Consequently, they lead to easterly winds along the equator. The Hadley circulation is also associated with westerly winds at its northernmost and southernmost extents. The rising air along the equatorial branch of the Hadley circulation leads to wet conditions and low pressure in this region. Air converges at low levels and diverges at high levels. The point at which air convergence occurs is known as the intertropical convergence zone. The intertropical convergence zone is formally defined as a region in the equatorial zone where the trade winds converge. That is, air tends to come together in the near surface and rise within this region. Namely, as air converges from the northern and southern hemispheres, it has nowhere to go but up. Consequently, this is a major driver in the rising motion that exists in this region. The intertropical convergence zone, because it's associated with strong rising motion, can also be visible as a band of clouds that encircle the Earth near the equator. These are regions of vigorous deep convection. Here's a depiction of the Hadley circulation from the side. What we see is a deep intertropical convergence zone type region with significant deep convection. In this region, air tends to rise all the way up to the tropopause, which is located at about 17 kilometers altitude. It's also associated with significant precipitation. Once it reaches the tropopause, the air will spread out laterally. That is, as long as air is being pushed in from the bottom, it again has to go somewhere. So it spreads out laterally into the northern and southern hemispheres. As it gets farther away from the equator, the air cools, and consequently it naturally subsides back down to the surface. In order to replace the air that is now risen at the intertropical convergence zone, we must have a convergence of air. That is, air must be brought in from the northern and southern hemispheres in the near surface. This then completes the circulation. If we look at zonally average potential temperature, as we had in the previous lecture, what we see is that in this equatorial band we have very weak vertical gradients of potential temperature. This means, of course, that we have the greatest atmospheric instability occurring within this region. In fact, in the polar regions we have much more stability because of the sharper gradients of potential temperature. If one looks further at equivalent potential temperature, which if you recall incorporates moisture as well, we find that the gradient of potential temperature in the rising area of the Hadley circulation is approximately zero. That means that when it comes to moist fluid parcels, this region is particularly unstable, and so naturally gives rise to deep convection. <laughs>
The vigorous convection that occurs within this region further removes vertical gradients and leads to a very smooth vertical profile of equivalent potential temperature. Within the fairly narrow band of the ITCZ associated with deep convection, we have strong saturated updrafts that are then responsible for producing condensation and heavy precipitation. The net result is that the air when it reaches the tropopause is very dry. Because the area of ascent is rather narrow and the region of descent rather broad, the convective activity induced by the Hadley circulation essentially acts as a drying agent for the whole atmosphere. Further, the subsidence that is incurred in the subtropics regions because of the descending air prevents the production of additional precipitation within this region and prevents convective activity that would naturally give rise to that precipitation. All right, so what happens to the air as it gets farther away from the rising portion of the Hadley circulation? Well, we studied earlier today that once you get away from the equator, most winds are subject to geostrophic balance. As we get farther away, we actually are moving towards a region of lower pressure. Consequently, as the air increases its velocity, Coriolis force kicks in, and this has the effect of turning the air parcels to the right. Thus, as air moves away from the rising branch of the Hadley circulation and moves towards the subsidence region, we have that the air becomes increasingly westerly. That is, it tends to blow from the west to the east. This is where we get the mid-latitudinal jet streams. Formally, jet streams are fast-flowing, narrow, meandering air currents in the atmosphere. Some of the fastest wind speeds in the atmosphere can be found within these jet streams, and they typically occur near the tropopause at the, in the subtropical regions. The subtropical jets specifically tend to appear between 200 and 300 hectopascals, or about 10 kilometers up in the atmosphere. They extend around the northernmost extent of the Hadley circulation in the northern hemisphere and the southernmost extent in the southern hemisphere. You can see them in this figure as the two regions of large zonal winds located at about 200 hectopascals altitude at about 30 degrees north and south. There are two primary jet streams within every hemisphere. We have the subtropical jet stream, which we just looked at, as well as a polar jet stream, which tends to be more windy than the subtropical jet stream, but can be associated with even higher wind speeds. The subtropical jets appear at the confluence of the Hadley and the Farrell cells, and these are again associated with geostrophic motion that is induced because of air diverging away from the equator. The polar jets appear at the confluence of the polar and the Farrell cells, Thus, they occur at approximately 30 degrees north and south, but they also tend to, tend to migrate depending on the seasonality. That is, during the northern hemisphere winter season, when the intertropical convergent zone has migrated into the southern hemisphere, the polar jets tend to move to be about 40 degrees north. As mentioned previously, the wind speeds in these jets can get very strong, reaching more than 400 kilometers per hour or 250 miles per hour at the most extreme. For more information on jet streams, you can check out this weather.gov website link at the bottom. Here's an idealized image showing the positions of these two jet streams. The subtropical jet stream is located above the surface high that typically appears in the subtropical regions, and it's located at the confluence of the Hadley and the Farrell cells. The polar jet stream is located along the polar front, and it is associated with this mid-latitudinal low, which is at the confluence of the Farrell cells and the polar cells. All right, let's return to this picture of the general circulation. So in the meridional direction, we have rising motion at the equator and subsidence in the subtropics. We have that when this air diverges from the equator, that it'll tend to turn in the westerly direction. That is, it'll tend to blow from the west in accordance with geostrophic wind. This is in some sense stymieing the flux of heat from equator to pole. Namely, how can you transport heat from equator to pole when the air is instead blowing along a line of constant latitude, or directly from west to east? This is where instabilities associated with eddy motions come into play, and we'll discuss those shortly. But when we talk about the returning branch of the circulation, as that air returns to the equator in order to fuel further convective activity, it will end up again turning to the right in the northern hemisphere and turning to the left in the southern hemisphere. Because this is the returning circulation, turning to the right in the northern hemisphere means that it will turn towards the west. Consequently, we have a easterly circulation occurring 
in the equatorial near surface. These are, of course, the trade winds that are responsible for blowing from east to west in this near equatorial band. There's actually a simple argument that in requires that we have both easterly and westerly flows over the surface. If it was the case that we only had flow from one direction, that is, if the wind only blew from the west, then we would end up inducing a net torque on the planet. For those of you who remember your basic physics, torque will basically cause additional rotation of the planet. So in order for these forces to be balanced, and in order for the atmosphere to not induce further rotation of the planet, it must be the case that the easterly torque induced on the planetary surface must balance the westerly torque on the surface. Consequently, we then require in the atmosphere that there be a balance of both easterly and westerly winds. All right, let's turn our attention to the mid-latitudinal atmosphere. As mentioned before, the Hadley circulation leads to diverging winds near the top of the troposphere. These diverging winds then turn in accordance with geostrophic balance in order to respond to the Coriolis force that grows as we move away from the equator. Consequently, in, at 30 degrees north and 30 degrees south, we have winds that blow approximately from west to east. Again, this basically stymies the flux of heat from equator to pole, and so some additional mechanism needs to come into play. In fact, it turns out that if this flow were to be persistent, it would block heat transport from equator to pole, and we would get very strong temperature gradients between these two regions. This configuration is not stable, and quickly gives rise to instabilities along this boundary. These instabilities are in the form of large-scale mid-latitudinal eddies, or large-scale circulations, that are large-scale rotating meteorological systems that appear in the mid-latitudes as instabilities in the mean flow. This mixing motion, kind of analogous to taking a spoon to a large glass of water, is then responsible for mixing warm air to the south with colder air in the north. They're very important for driving the weather in the mid-latitudes and are associated with many key mid-latitudinal weather features, including winter storm systems. Extratropical cyclones are associated with a central low pressure. This low pressure induces a counterclockwise rotation that brings warm air to the north, to the east of the low, and cold air to the south, to the west of the low. Consequently, it's responsible for mixing the air and leading to a net transport of heat from lower latitudes to higher latitudes. In order to learn more about these extratropical cyclone systems, I'll refer you to Introduction to Atmospheric Dynamics, Chapter 5, where we examine quantitatively the conditions that give rise to these extratropical cyclone systems and how they propagate. Extratropical cyclone heat flux can be quantified using the meridional eddy flux of temperature. This is equal to the perturbation meridional velocity, that is the meridional velocity at each time minus the reference climatological meridional velocity, multiplied by the temperature perturbation, which is equal to the temperature at a particular time minus the climatological temperature. What we see is that in the winter season, we have significant poleward transport associated with this extratropical cyclone activity. Particularly in the northern hemisphere, we see the strongest eddy heat flux towards the poles in the winter season. And in the southern hemisphere, in the southern hemisphere winter season, we see the strongest eddy flux of temperature towards the south pole. Here's a depiction of an extratropical cyclone system from 2017. These extratropical cyclone systems are also known to draw in significant amounts of moisture from the subtropics. In doing so, they are responsible for the production of what are known as atmospheric river events. Atmospheric rivers provide a mechanism by which latent heat can be transported from the subtropics towards the poles, leading to another mechanism for heat transport from lower latitudes to higher latitudes. Formally, atmospheric rivers are long, narrow, transient corridors of enhanced water vapor transport, and these are particularly relevant to mid-latitudinal weather along the west coast of continents. Atmospheric rivers are known to be responsible for 90% of global meridional water vapor transport, yet they only cover 10% of the Earth's total circumference. They're also responsible for about 30-40% to 40 of precipitation and snowpack along the west coast of continents.
The image on the right here, coming from NASA, shows total column water vapor. In this image, we can see multiple atmospheric river events, including one that is, imp that is impacting California, one that's impacting England, one that's stretching through the South Atlantic, and another one which is impacting Patagonia in South America. Often, many of these events are present on the Earth's surface at any time, but they're particularly prominent in the winter season of these hemispheres. All right, so pulling together everything we've discussed about heat transport, we know that in the equatorial bands, the heat, total heat transport is dominated by the Hadley circulation. That is, this natural circulation cell-like pattern gives rise to much of the heat transport from the equatorial regions to the subtropics. However, at this point, because the winds have been redirected to be westerly, we instead have that we need to have an alternative mechanism that enables heat transport from lower latitudes to higher latitudes. Consequently, in this mid-latitudinal region, stretching from 30 degrees in either hemisphere towards the poles, we have that most heat transport is actually dominated by the eddy flux, that is, by extratropical cyclones. Recall that these extratropical cyclones produce the greatest eddy flux of sensible heat in the winter season of the respective hemispheres and they're also responsible for latent heat transport, particularly through the generation of atmospheric river events. All right, to finish off this lecture, let's discuss the relationship between the zonal wind field and the temperature field using what's known as the thermal wind relationship. Thermal wind is a vector difference between the geostrophic wind that occurs at an upper level and that at a lower level. In this sense, it is not a real wind, but is instead a difference of winds. However, the thermal wind provides some important insights into the behavior of the atmospheric system. Specifically, we know that the thermal wind points such that cold air is always to the left of the thermal wind, and warm air is to the right. Consequently, the thermal wind vector points parallel to isotherms, or lines of constant temperature. In the image depicted below, we can see a thickness of layers. Note that warmer air tends to have a larger volume associated with it. Consequently, this pushes up these pressure surfaces to the right of the diagram. The colder air is thinner. It has less volume associated with it because it's associated with a higher density. Consequently, the layers are much closer together. The geostrophic wind vectors that are produced by this particular configuration are shown by the black arrows in this diagram. Note that because the tilt of these surfaces is larger at higher altitude, we end up with a stronger geostrophic wind. The starting point for our derivation of the thermal wind relationship is the definition of the components of the geostrophic wind shown here at the top. Recall that we derived these earlier in our lecture. We can then differentiate these with respect to pressure in order to understand how they vary in the vertical direction. We can then flip the order of the differentials in each case. We can then use that di phi di p is related to temperature via the hydrostatic relationship. By substituting this in, we can then show that the variation of the geostrophic wind with altitude is related to the variation of the temperature. Specifically, the zonal geostrophic wind is related to meridional variation of the temperature, and the meridional geostrophic wind is related to the zonal variations of the temperature field. This is what's known as the thermal wind relationship. The thermal wind itself, though, is a vector difference. So we can rewrite this relationship by taking the pressure from the right-hand side of the equality, moving it to the other side, and then changing the uh, independent quantity to be the logarithm of pressure. If we then integrate this over a particular layer, we get that the thermal wind uh, can be written in terms of the components shown below. Specifically, we assess that the zonal thermal wind is related to the meridional variations in the layer mean temperature multiplied by a, the logarithm of the pressure ratio between the top and bottom surfaces and then multiplied by R over F. This gives us the final form for our thermal wind vector components and so we can compute the components of the thermal wind using these quantities. Here's an example below. Here we have a geostrophic wind vector at 500 hectopascals, that is an upper level, and a geostrophic wind vector at 1000 hectopascals, that is a lower level.
Given these two vectors, we can compute the thermal wind as the difference between these two vectors. That is, the vector geostrophic wind at the upper level minus the vector geostrophic wind at the lower level. Doing so yields the red vector, which is the thermal wind between these two layers. What's key is that the thermal wind always points parallel to lines of constant temperature. And this can be demonstrated by taking the dot product of the thermal wind vector with the gradient of the mean temperature. After some slight manipulations, one observes that this is equal to zero. That is, the gradient of temperature is perpendicular to the thermal wind, or the thermal wind points along lines of constant mean layer temperature. All right, there are two types of winds that naturally emerge from this configuration. If it turns out to be that the winds tend to turn clockwise as you go from lower levels to upper levels, this is indicative of what is known as veering winds. Clockwise rotation with height is also associated with warm air advection, as we see in this figure. Because the thermal wind always points along lines of constant temperature, and the wind is always warm to the right of the thermal wind, in order to achieve this particular configuration, you must have that air is being advected from the warm region into the cold region. Analogously, if the winds instead rotate counterclockwise with height, you end up with a configuration known as backing winds. So these are, again, winds that are rotating counterclockwise as you go from lower altitudes to higher altitudes. And in this configuration, we always have cold air advection. That is, the winds tend to point from the cold region into the warm region. All right, so the key point from the thermal wind that we want to achieve is an understanding between the temperature profile, which we studied fairly early on, and the zonal wind profile, which came up in our discussion of the general circulation. The temperature profile emerges naturally from understanding radiative balance within the atmosphere. The zonal winds, on the other hand, are, on the other hand, are associated with the dynamic character of the atmosphere. But because of the thermal wind, we know that these two concepts are closely connected with one another. All right, so this allows us to answer this question. Given the mean zonal temperature profile below, where are the zonal jets located? And a more accurate or more quantitative analysis allows us to derive a full zonal wind profile given this particular temperature profile. Okay, so we'll proceed as follows. Consider a few latitudes and a few altitudes where we can compute di t di y. Through the thermal wind relationship, we know that that meridional variation in temperature is closely related to the variation of the zonal wind speed with respect to pressure. And then, using hydrostatic balance, we can then relate the vertical variation of ug with respect to pressure to the vertical variation with respect to altitude. This is effectively a vertical integral that we will then be computing. Note that we also rely on the fact that the zonal wind speed is approximately zero in the near surface. All right, let's look at these few profiles that we've picked out. Well, the top profile, it goes from warmer temperatures in the south to cooler temperatures in the north. In the top right, we again have analogous behavior. For the second line on the left, we have warmer temperatures in the south and cooler temperatures in the north. And then on the far right, we again have warmer temperatures in the south and cooler temperatures in the north. The profile at about 30 degrees north, though, shows different behavior, namely because of the tropopause in the equatorial regions being pushed up, we have cooler temperatures towards the equator and warmer temperatures towards the north. Consequently, at this point, we have dt di y to be positive. In the southern hemisphere on the left-hand side, we also have an increase in temperatures as we go from the cool near-surface polar region to the equatorial region. But then in the northern hemisphere, we have temperatures decreasing as one goes from equator to pole. So let's write these down. That gives the following signs along each of these cross-sections. All right, so what do we do next? Well, now we want to know the variation of the zonal wind with respect to pressure. Well, we can compute that then directly from the thermal wind expression on the top here. The only thing we need to keep in mind is that the Coriolis parameter has a sign change depending on which hemisphere we're in. Namely, in the northern hemisphere, the Coriolis parameter is positive, and in the southern hemisphere, the Coriolis parameter is negative. So this requires us to flip the signs within the southern hemisphere for this calculation. That then gives the following values for di u g di p.
Okay, then how do we get diuji di z? Well, we know that diuji di z is proportional to the negative of diuji di p because pressure decreases as one goes to higher altitudes. So that requires us to flip the signs for all of these cross sections. Consequently, we get a final sign uh, within the light blue boxes here for each cross section. This then tells us how the zonal wind varies as we go up by altitude through that particular cross section. All right, how can we then use this in order to get the zonal wind profile? Well, at the near surface, again, we have effectively zero zonal wind. As we go up through the lower levels of the troposphere, we must have that the zonal wind speeds are increasing in both mid-latitudinal regions because di u g di z is positive. As we get to higher levels, we then have a decrease in those wind speeds. Namely, in the southern hemisphere, we see that decrease to appear consistent as we go to higher and higher elevations and lower and lower pressures. That is because we see a negative sign associated with the di u di di u g di z through these regions. In the northern hemisphere, on the other hand, we see a slight decrease as we pass by a height of approximately 16 kilometers or a pressure of about 100 hectopascals, again associated with this sign flip. But then as we get up into the stratosphere, we must have an increase in the zonal wind speeds as we go to higher altitudes. This is exactly what we see then from the zonal wind profile. The cross sections are again highlighted here with the signs of those cross sections shown in light blue. So as we see in the bottom, we see an increase in zonal wind speeds as we go up. Then in both hemispheres, we see a decrease as we get to the height of the tropopause. And then behavior in the stratosphere is different depending on which hemisphere you're in. In the wintertime hemisphere, we see an increase in the zonal wind speeds, producing positive zonal winds, that is westerly winds. Whereas in the summertime hemisphere, we have a, instead a decrease in wind speeds and a flipping of sign. So we now have easterly winds through the stratosphere in this region. The presence of the jets is indicated by where we flip sign from these cross sections. Namely, it must occur between a region where we have increasing zonal winds below and decreasing zonal winds above. So this nicely allows us to isolate the positions of these zonal jets within the zonal wind profile. All right. That's everything for today. Uh, next time, we're going to be investigating the general circulation in a little bit more detail and looking at how near surface pressure and frictional effects play a role in affecting the general circulation of the atmosphere. Thank you.